I'm going to start uh, with a sad statement, and then hopefully I can make you happy by the end. Here's the sad statement. People ask sometimes about Google X, how far ahead should we look? When we try these moonshots, when we try to change something about the world, should we look five years ahead? Should we look 10 years ahead? Should we look 15 years ahead? And I say, 15 years is too long. Five to 10 years is a good range. And they say, why? Why can't we look 15 years ahead? Because technology is changing so fast, this is my answer, that when you start to build a project, you get technology lock-in. You get stuck with the architecture, I mean the technical architecture, of the thing that you're doing, the ways that you're trying to approach the problem in those first couple of years. If you look 15 years ahead, if you want to solve a problem 15 years from now, the best way to do it is wait, do nothing for five to seven years. Let technology move forward, then start. You'll actually get more done than if you start right now. That's how bad technology lock-in is. The subject for today is cities in 2030, which is 15 years from now. You can't do nothing for the next five to seven years. But it still might be true that you'd have a better city if you did nothing for five to seven years and then got started. Because you get building lock-in, you get infrastructure lock-in in cities just like you do in technology. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Google X and about the things we've learned and hopefully I can leave you with a more uplifting note than I've started with. So Google X is in the business of trying to take these moonshots that have this set of characteristics, these three things. First, there has to be a huge problem in the world that we can name and that we want to make go away. Number two, there has to be some kind of radical proposal for how to make that thing go away. Some kind of science fiction sounding product or service, which whether we can make it or not, if we could make it, would make the problem go away. And then number three, it has to not be completely science fiction. There has to be a glimmer of hope based in science and technology that we could actually do it. I'm gonna share with you some of my experiences having taken Google X through this process. I will mention a few of the projects that we've done and then I will come back to the subject of cities um, after I've laid a little bit of that foundation as it were. Uh, so one of the lessons that I think uh, we've learned that might be relevant to thinking about the future of cities is the mantra that I give all the time to people at Google X, which is think 10 times, not 10%. Whatever it is that you want to fix about the world, try to make it 10 times better, not 10% better. There's two reasons for this. The first is that most of the costs of working on something are fixed. They're the same amount expensive in terms of time, in terms of money, and often in terms of complexity. Whether you try to make things a tiny bit better or massively better, if the ratio is the rewards and the costs, and the costs are relatively fixed, and you want to make that ratio as big as possible, go big on the rewards. That's how to do it. That's actually the secondary reason that I tell people to work on things that are 10 times better rather than 10% better. The real reason, the primary reason, is that if I ask you to make things 10% better, if I ask you to make a city 10% better, you will immediately start fussing with the details of the city. Maybe we can paint the lines on the roads a little bit different. Maybe we can time the traffic signals a little bit better. Tweak, tweak, tweak. 
tweak, 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 maybe we'll get to 10%. But if I tell you that 10 times as many people have to live in Tokyo happily 15 years from now as live here today, we're gonna have to totally start over. Because there's no way to do that, there's no way for people to get to work 10 times as fast as they do today in Tokyo, doing anything like what they do today. So you know in your hearts, if I ask you to do that, that you can't tweak around the edges, you can't optimize. You're going to have to go to some of the most basic assumptions, in this case about what a city is, and break at least a few of those assumptions. Maybe it's not possible to make it so that 10 times as many people could live in Tokyo and still be happy. Maybe it's not possible for them to get to work 10 times faster. But if I give you permission to try, if I tell you it's possible, and you really believe that long enough to work hard to try to make that happen, even if you miss, you'll make it three or four times better. If you shoot for 10%, you'll be lucky to get to 5% better. The second thing I want to leave you with is getting out to the world and doing things. Our experience has been that the way that you learn and get better very quickly is by having experiences, is not by sitting around in a room, scratching our beards, and trying to simulate the world and all of the reactions the world can have to the things that we make. And this still looks somewhat crazy, the way we do it, but five or six years ago when we started, it was considered totally crazy. You don't beta test cars, Astro. You do not beta test telecommunications equipment en masse. You do not beta test things the size of an airplane for wind production. You do not beta test contact lenses in the med tech field. But we have done every single one of those things and others. When we're half done, when we're not even half done, we get out in the world and try it and fail miserably. But we learn and then we can iterate. We can try again with all the things that we've learned. One of the challenges for making radically better cities is how do you do that? And I'm telling you that creeping forward in the way that we have historically done it all over the world, building a city, trying it on for size for a hundred years, and then deciding what we should do about it is not going to cut it. We are going to have another two and a half billion people by 2030 on the planet. We need houses for those people to live in, or places for them to live. We need office space for those people. And we, are, we just literally do not have the money worldwide to provide that the way cities are currently built. And even if we did have the money, we don't really know what the future is. And the, I don't know what the future is. I'm not gonna end this by telling you what the future of cities is, just in case you were all holding your breath for that. And you don't know what the future of cities is. No one in this room, no one on the planet knows what the future of cities is. There are bright people, and there are people who can make pretty pictures and good sounding predictions. And a few of them will turn out to be right. But there is absolutely no way to tell who those people are ahead of time. The only way to do it is go try things. So the people who figure out how to make the best cities in the future are going to be the ones who figure out how to prototype buildings and even prototype cities, which is not something the world has gotten good at yet. But I can tell you from our experiences, building pretty complex things at Google X, not as complicated as a city, but self-driving cars, airborne wind turbines, uh, stratospheric balloons for covering the world and providing internet to the other four billion people are sufficiently complicated that I feel like we have at least a little glimpse into how hard it is to go out early, try, and iterate. Uh, one of the other things before I get back to cities uh, more specifically is my experience around failure and feedback. 
So we feel like we can't afford to fail when we do anything. I understand that feeling. If I give you a choice between succeeding and failing, we're all going to pick succeeding. Failing doesn't sound good when I put it that way. But whatever your idea is about a building, about a city, about a car that drives itself, it is full of wrong assumptions, wrong ideas, bad designs. Mine is, yours are, it's guaranteed. You only have two choices. Let me put it to you this way instead of succeeding and failing. Would you like to know now about all those problems? Or would you like to spend $50 million and wait three years and then find out what the problems are? When you put it that way, all of a sudden, everyone wants to know the problems at the beginning. That is the power of failing fast. And you have to actually create a culture in which the people who you're working with understand the benefit to doing it, the intellectual part, and then you have to make it safe. That's the hard part. You have to reward people when they discover problems soon rather than later. And it's hard because if someone stands up and says the thing we were working on actually is a bad idea, let's stop. They just saved you an enormous amount of money. But in that moment, it sounds like they failed. And so what most of us do intuitively is punish them. We punish them by not giving them a bonus. We don't give them a promotion. We prevent them from getting cred credibility with their peers. We take their people away. And then we wonder why we drag so much dead weight around in our organizations. The reason is because we have unconsciously sent signals to all of the people in all of our organizations that we don't want them to be honest with us about the projects they're working on that should end. So, coming back to cities, part of what we have to do, and I know it seems like we cannot afford to fail with a building, Astro. There's too much money at stake and there's too much safety at stake. But you know, we can't afford to kill someone with a self-driving car while we're learning. We take safety super seriously. And yet we've been learning machines, I mean as an organization, and we're literally making a learning machine in the self-driving cars, for six years now. We have found ways to try things, be wrong and iterate, without endangering the people around us. We've done that with our stratospheric balloon project. We've done that with our contact lenses. We've done that um, with, the, uh, with Google Glass. We've done that with um, our airborne wind turbines. We can do that with buildings, too. We can do that with cities, too. So here's the good news. I don't think you actually have to wait, that we actually have to wait five to seven years before we do anything. But if we're talking about 30 years from now, and assuming that technology continues not only at the pace it's going at, but that the first and second derivative continue to be what they have been, that is, that technology's rate of change continues to increase, there is no hope that we will be able to predict what a city should be or correctly in, um, integrate the right technologies into our city, independent of what technologies you're excited about right now. But we can make our cities radically more flexible. So that's my 10x proposal to you, is imagine a city, imagine it both the buildings and the infrastructure of the city so that you could take down a building in one-tenth the time. You could put up a building in one-tenth the time. You could change the inside of the building in one-tenth the time. You could change the traffic flow through different parts of the city in one-tenth of the time. You know, the time was you could actually plan out in a city where people were going to go. You could actually direct them by making some streets wider and some smaller. You could change where the lights were and things like that. Those days are over. Google and other um, traffic 
uh, guides now tell people, don't go on that road, there are too many people. Go over here instead. The architects of the city are no longer actually deciding the use of the city. Not that Google is deciding it, but it is becoming more and more an epiphenomenal property of the city. It is a dynamic experience. Cities can either be victims of that rapidly changing technology, or they can try to embrace it. And by embracing it, I mean, how can, I don't have the answer for you, it's a question, it's a challenge to us, how can we make cities so that they actually accommodate, even encourage that kind of dynamic change in use over time? How can the technologies that are plugged into this city be ones we don't need to be right about? We can plug this technology in, and then when this one, which is better, comes along, it isn't a painful process to remove this technology and put this one in. And that requires a very different way of architecting buildings, of architecting the cities, and of thinking about how these costs are paid for and amortized. Right now, because of the way buildings are built, because of the way they are sold, and because of the way they are maintained, it is not necessarily in the interests of the people who build a lot of these buildings to do the things that I'm talking about. So if we really want buildings and cities to be radically more flexible with respect to the technologies that are coming, we also need to think about how to create a set of incentives for society that would cause the people who are designing the buildings, who would cause the people who are building the buildings, to cause the people who are changing the buildings, all to have a stake in the continued and increasing flexibility of the buildings and of the cities. Because today, that is not how things are set up. So I wish I could tell you that I had the answer for which technologies you should pick. I don't. But I do believe that what I've just pitched you is a moonshot that we ought to take, and it's a moonshot that we can accomplish. I know that the things that I just said sound impossible, but they don't break a law of physics, and great moonshots hang out right there in between almost impossible and totally impossible. And I think that the 10x for a city, that kind of radical flexibility to change and accommodate as new technologies come is in that sweet spot of a wonderful moonshot waiting to happen. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.